Amen. Hallelujah. Matthew 28, you're there? Verse 1, it reads as this. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, uh, came Mary Magdalene and the other, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like reading this ridiculous. <laughs> Wow. The first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Hallelujah. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. Amen. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run and run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. In heaven and in earth, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. Amen. The ends of the world. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. There's a whole lot of scripture in Matthew 28, and I obviously can't get through everything that is locked into that scripture tonight but we want to just touch on a few things obviously it's resurrection day and so we're talking about the resurrection of the lord and savior jesus christ and just a few days ago last uh sunday we celebrated the triumphal entry right celebrate palm sunday and we talked about the triumphal entry of the lord into the city of jerusalem and what that meant for him and what that means for us to this day and so we know that this whole week we've been taking time to look uh, at the resurrection of the lord look at the passion of jesus and to see what that means and i know it's very hard in america especially in the american church to uh kind of come out from the world system Amen. What does that mean? We, we, we in America, we celebrate what? Easter. Nothing wrong with it. I'm not one of those people who are like, boom, you shouldn't celebrate Easter. All right? That's, that's not me, so you can breathe. Uh, clearly, I, we had an egg hunt. I celebrate Easter, right? But what I'm saying is Easter, as well as so many other Christian holidays, have been, become so commercial and they have become so about image. And, 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 and even in the church, I don't know where you come from or what you're used to. I got saved in the Apostolic Faith, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, and it's kind of like the sister organization of the Kojic Church, only differences in some doctrines. And, and so Easter, as well as Christmas, but especially Easter, because, you know, that's all the bright colors and things. That's when everybody gets real, real dressed up, put on your nicest suit, your nicest dress, your nicest hat, come to church. Amen. 
And it becomes about form and fashion. And so in, in doing so, we lose the message of what it means. We lose the sacredness of it. We lose the power of it. And so it becomes about do, 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 do. And but by the time we get into the house of God, we, we're so worn out from all that we've done that we, we're not even in a place to even hear the message of the gospel. And so we don't even have the joy in our heart. Amen. We have beautiful flowers here today. and Everything looks so wonderful. Everybody looks so beautiful. Amen. But there ought to be a joy. Is your insides as decorated as your outsides? Amen. How does your soul look? Amen. I believe it was uh, David that said, I'll command my soul to praise him. He said, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. What he was saying is, he's speaking to his own self. Why are you cast down? Why are you disquieted within me? He didn't even give himself uh, time to answer. He just said, whatever it is, hope in God. Hallelujah. And so as we progress as a culture... And we more and more take God out of what we do or take the importance of Christ out of what we do or the centrality of the gospel out of what we do, then more and more we lose the power of it all. And this is just my personal conviction. I'm trying my hardest to stop saying Easter so much only because Easter is the English translation of the word Ishtar, which is the goddess that is celebrated at this time of year for pagans. They celebrate the goddess Ishtar, which is the goddess of like fertility and all this stuff. That's why little bunnies are used and eggs are used. That's where it all comes from, from these pagan practices. Amen. Uh, but, but I believe just like anything, that as long as you keep the main thing, the main thing, then you can have your egg hunt and you can dress up and all of this as long as you keep your focus on Christ. And as long as at the end of the day, he is the one that is glorified, then it's all good. Amen. Mary and the other Mary came to the tomb. They didn't come to the tomb expecting him to be alive. They came to the tomb expecting to take care of a dead body. They came to care for the body and to rub it in certain oils and put certain things on the body as is custom uh, in Jewish tradition. And so as they came to the tomb, an angel had rolled back the stone and sat upon it. And they said, uh, he, he said, he is not here for he has risen as he said. He's reminding the Marys, listen, the one you're looking for is not here because he told you he wasn't going to be here, but come and see the place where the Lord laid. Amen. Hallelujah. Come and see that the tomb is empty. Come and see that there is all this infallible proof that God has risen as he said. Thank you, Jesus. And it goes on and it says, it says, behold, there was a great earthquake and for the angel, of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment as white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, fear not. For I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. How often do we uh, seek the Lord? I think this is a very important question for us to ask tonight is, are we seeking Jesus? Are we truly longing after him? And are our hearts positioned in a place to seek the Lord? Hallelujah. Or are we comfortable with the form and the fashion of it all? Amen find it interesting that it was only the two Marys that came to the tomb seeking Jesus when he had said that he would rise. Amen. And the angel descended from heaven and he knew, he said to them, I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. Hallelujah. When you have a seek for the Lord, the Lord will always show up and he's going to show up in a manner that is greater than what you expected. Hallelujah. When you truly seek him, when your heart is really longing after God, and I don't know about you, but I'm just in a place with God where I don't really enjoy church as much as I do the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Because, I mean, we can do church all day, but, but I need God. I need his presence. I need his 
person. I need his passion and I need his help to be with me. Hallelujah, because I enjoy, say, I say it often here, that, you know, I, I want your friendship and I want your fellowship, but I don't need it. I don't come for it. If I get that, amen, but I came for Jesus. Hallelujah, I came to hear about him. I came to lift him up. Come, let us magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. Because there is a multiplication that happens in the, the gathering of the saints. That when we gather together and begin to lift him up and begin to praise his name. Not you waiting for somebody to do it for you. But when you praise him and when I praise him. And, and then God, he stands up and he sees my people are calling. And the scripture says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Hallelujah. So I didn't come to talk to you as much as I did to talk to him while you talk to him. Because if we talk to him together, he's going to come. Amen. Hallelujah. God longs for nothing more than to be with his people. For all of eternity, God's love has been violently pursuing us. God wishes that none should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And God is violently in love with you. Hallelujah. Song of Solomon, chapter number four, verse nine says, with one flick of your eye, you've ravished my heart. God is saying to his people, when you even think about me, when you think about spending time with me, when you think about being with me, just if I even can catch a glance of your eye, my heart is ravished. Hallelujah. That's, that's the love of God for us in that while we were yet sinners, God showed his love for us that Christ died while we were yet in sin. Our hearts were black and cold and, and hardened to God and our backs were turned to him. We weren't even thinking about God. We weren't thinking about being saved. We didn't care. We were in the world lost and without hope. But God, he loved us. Hallelujah. And I find it amazing that God is always with us. And it is God who is beckoning at the hearts of his people. Even now in this room tonight, the Lord is trying to break through your heart and break through your heart and spirit to say, seek me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I believe the scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found. And he's saying, I want you to seek me. I want you to look for me. I want you to long for me. I want you to desire me. David said it best, one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And I find it interesting that it's so easy for us as humans, especially here in our culture, that, that, that it is easy to put other things and other people before God. Amen. Hallelujah. Many of us have idols in our hearts they may not be physical idols made of stone or of wood or of gold or of silver but idols in our heart things and people that we put before God heard John Piper once say I believe it was John Piper maybe it was somebody else but he said if you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is grab your phone and check your Facebook then we know who your God is hallelujah what is the first thing you think about in the morning? What's the last thing you think about before you go to sleep? Are you in relationship with God like that? And if you're not, don't feel condemned. Hallelujah. But long for it. And if you don't have that desire or that seek, ask him for it. Sometimes I find myself saying, Lord, give me a desire to desire you. Give me a hunger to hunger for you because y'all know we can't do it anyway except the Lord allow us to amen. amen and so I need God's grace to help me seek for him even as Mary was approaching the tomb the angel said I know you seek Jesus hallelujah God honors a seeking heart scripture says that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled glory to God who is righteousness there is none that is righteous. No, not one, but Jesus is righteous. Jesus is our righteousness. He is our salvation. He is our healer. He is our provider. He is our mind regulator. He is everything that we need him to be. And the scripture says, seek him. Hallelujah. 
Seek those things that are above. Seek those things that are above. Where is Jesus? He has risen as he said. Which means he's not down here. But he's up here. Look up. I believe it was uh, in, the, in the Psalms of David when it says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Now, why did they say that in that day? In that day, they, the, the Psalms, there's what's called the Psalms of Ascent or the Psalms of Ascension. And there's a, there are a group of Psalms, and Psalms were basically songs that they would sing uh, to the Lord. And the Psalms of Ascension... In that day, the temple was on top of a hill. And so as the children of Israel would make their way to the temple, they would go up the hill. They would ascend into the temple of the Lord. And so they're called the Psalms of Ascension. And so David wrote the psalm, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. What David was saying is there is no help in the hill. Hallelujah. But on top of the hill is the temple. And in the temple, in the holy place, is where the presence of God lives. My help comes from the Lord. I'm going to lift up my eyes to where he is. Hallelujah. God always calls for us to come up to a higher place. I thoroughly believe that when you get saved, when you're born again and you become a new creature... Paul talks about that it starts this battle, this war that goes on in the on the inside between the old man and the new man, between the flesh and between the spirit. Because y'all know when you get saved, the only thing saved about you is your spirit. Amen. Your spirit is sealed by the Holy Ghost of promise, but your soul and your flesh are being saved. They're in the process of sanctification and they're going to continue in that process until the great coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so he says, uh, he says, uh, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. We have to be able to come up to the high place, to come away with the Lord. I know you seek Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here for he has risen as he said. Think on those things that are above. We have to come up. Oftentimes, if you find yourself struggling with your old man or with doubt or with unbelief or all of these fleshly, carnal things, then you need to come up because you're living in the low place. I know you seek Jesus. I know your heart is right. I know you want the Lord, but you're living in the low place. And so I need you to come up to the high place so that you can seek him who has arisen because he's no longer down here. Hallelujah. I know when you met him, he was down here because he came to where you are to bring you into where he is. So I know when you came to know the Lord, I know when you bowed your knee and received him into your heart. I know when you went down in the waters of baptism and you came up a new creature that you met him on this level. But now as you're seeking him, you got to come up. That's why the the, the scripture, uh, Paul said, I lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets me. Hallelujah. I don't know if you've ever rode a bike before, but often riding bike up a hill is a lot harder than going downhill. (laughs) When you're going downhill, it's always the best, right? Because it's like a roller coaster. You just just relax and roll on down the hill. But when you go up a hill, especially a steep hill, you got to really push. Hallelujah. And in that same manner, in our journey of salvation, Song of Solomon, God says to his people, come up here, come away, come up into a hill of my, into the chamber of my love. Come away with me. Hallelujah. And so in this journey of salvation, we're on an upward journey because after the crucifixion comes the resurrection, comes the going up. Hallelujah. And so we have to press on to know the Lord. And I find it interesting. Here it is. Mary, they come to the tomb and, and, and they say, Jesus is not here. <laughs> and Mary takes off running. <laughs> Why? Because if you've ever found Jesus before and then you return to where you knew he was last time you checked and you find that he's not there anymore, you need to run. 
Hallelujah. Whether that's physically from a cold, dead church that no longer has the presence of the Lord, or whether that is in your spirit, you need to put on some running shoes and run. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the Bible says that as the Marys were running, Jesus met them along the way. Hallelujah. The angels told Mary that go to Galilee and warn the disciples that Jesus is going to meet them there. So as Mary, the, I'm going to say the Marys, all right? As the Marys were running, I'm sure they were thinking, we got to hurry up and tell the disciples, look, I don't even care about the disciples. I'm looking for Jesus. And as they're running, they're not expecting to meet him on the way. They're expecting to meet him in Galilee. But just like the Lord, he gives us an instruction to run after him. But he knows how weak we are, and he meets us along the way. Glory to God, which means you got to run on towards perfection. You're not going to reach it. But the Lord is going to meet you along the way. Listen to the response of the Marys as they were traveling along the way. Jesus shows up and meets them as they're, as they're running. That's very key. As they're running, which means you got to keep going. Hallelujah. Don't give up, but keep going. But, but look at the response. Jesus shows up and he says, all hail. I just love that. Maybe you don't love that, but I find confidence very amazing. And Jesus was very confident because he knows who he is. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the very presence of God demands a response. Amen. Hallelujah. When Jesus came to the fig tree, he was hungered. And the fig tree, it wasn't the season for the fig tree to produce figs. It wasn't its season. And it, didn't, it had leaves as if it was alive, as if it was bearing fruit. But it had no fruit. And Jesus came to the, to the fig tree and he cursed it and it died. I believe that Jesus did that because when the presence of God, which is life, shows up, then no matter the season, you got to bring forth fruit. And I believe that creation was in rebellion in that moment. And because it had not bared fruit, he cursed it. In the same manner, when Jesus shows up to the Marys, his presence demands a response. He said, all hail. And the Marys, they understood because it was the one they were searching for. Says, scripture says that they bowed down, they grabbed his feet, and they began to worship him. Hallelujah. When you find. The one who your heart's been longing for. Worship will be your response. Hallelujah. As we're in this Christian journey, I don't know what you're in it for. Maybe you're in it to feel like a morally right person. Or maybe you're in it to say, you know, I go to church or I do this or I do that. I don't know what you're in it for. But if you're really saved. If you've really encountered Jesus and your heart's been changed. There's been a transformation in your life. And he has become. The one that your heart longs for. I don't know if you've ever been in love before, but when you've really been in love, I remember the first time I was ever in love, it was like my heart just longed to be in their presence. I, I just couldn't wait to get off work, couldn't even wait to get out of church sometimes and, and just to be with them. God, come on, anybody? Thank you for the, amen. thank you, brother Walt. I appreciate that. Amen. And, and, but, but when your heart is really in love and when you really long for somebody, Mary, the Marys were seeking for him. They, they even were looking for him in a dead state. Because when you're in love, any way I can have you is good enough. They were looking for Jesus in a dead state. But when they found out he was alive, oh, my God, caused their feet to run. Thank you, Jesus. And when he showed up, it was like the heart skipped a beat. Boom, he's here. They fell down and they worshipped him. They didn't just fall down and worship him, but they grabbed a hold of his feet. If to say, if I could just hold you just for a moment. Hallelujah. I don't know if you've ever lost somebody close to you, somebody that you love, and you ever said to yourself, I wish I could just hold them one more time. Wish I could just see them just one more time. And imagine how the Marys felt when the one they loved rose again. Hallelujah. Not only rose again, but rose again to confirm that everything he had said was true. 
We talked about the day that Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, what we call the triumphal entry, but for Jesus was really not that triumphal. For Jesus was actually a very sad day. Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, and the disciples kicked off the praise party, and the disciples started crying out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And before you knew it, all the Jews, because he came in just as prophecy has spoke of, just as the scripture had said that he would come riding on a donkey and all of this. And so the, the Jews, as they saw the disciples praising Jesus for the right reasons, the Jews got excited because they thought finally the Messiah had come to set up a physical earthly kingdom and save them from the tyranny of the Romans. And so they began to cry out, Hosanna in the highest, and it broke Jesus' heart, and he cried in the midst of all of this praise. Because he says, you don't even realize. You have missed your day of visitation. You didn't even know it. Hallelujah. Because what you expected was not what you needed. And what you needed was not what you expected. Hallelujah. And so there were those that were praising God for all of the wrong reasons. But in the midst of the crowd of those that were praising him for the wrong reasons, those that had wrong motives, there was a remnant. There was a remnant of people who had an, a, a, a sincere heart, who had an authentic heart, who truly knew who Jesus was. Peter was in that crowd, and Peter had had a revelation of the Lord. Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter said, some say you're Elijah, some say you're this, and some say you're that. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? When Jesus was asking Peter, who do you say that I am? Jesus wasn't unsure of himself. He wasn't looking for somebody to affirm him like so many of us do. Jesus knew who he was. Why? Because he was the only begotten of the Father. The firstborn of many brethren. That's why I encourage those of you, when you truly get born again and you truly have relationship with God, think about how Jesus talked. I only do what I see him do. I only say what I hear him say. When you have a relationship with God like that, then you don't ever have to worry about what people think about you or who they think you are or what you should be because you know Jesus made a declaration of his identity. He said, lo, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It's written of me. Jesus made a testimony. He said, I found myself in the book. And now that I found myself, I can't never be lost again because I know who I am. Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? He said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ. Hallelujah. Son of the living God, he went on to declare who Jesus was. Jesus' response to him was, Peter, flesh and blood has not, re has not revealed this to you, but my, but my spirit. Amen. But by my father, this has been revealed to you. Hallelujah. And so I believe that there were those, I believe the Marys were there. There were those that had revelation of Jesus who were crying out with sincerity in their hearts. And on the day that the Lord uh, died, they were left with days. I mean, they tried their best to believe. They held on with all faith when they were all gathered together after the crucifixion of Jesus and they were encouraging one another he promised us he would return he promised us he said he was going to prepare a place on and on and on I can I can see even that there were those that doubted uh, among them and 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 were fearful that it was all over and that everything that they had believed was a lie and then on the third day Jesus rises from the dead and I could imagine that their faith was revived. And in that moment that all of the holding on and all of the hoping and all the casting out of the doubt and all the casting down of the unbelief in that moment was relieved. Because who can testify that it didn't happen? Even history shows the story of the, resur of the resurrection of Jesus. Not only that, but he rose. He chose to rise with his wounds. To give us infallible proofs of his resurrection. He even says to Thomas, stick your hand in the hole. So there's even hope for those that having done all to believe still doubt. Hallelujah. And I find it interesting, this is just a side note, that after Jesus had rose and he tarried with them many days, teaching them all things, that they were all gathered together in the room and, 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 and Thomas comes in. He had missed the visitation prior. 
Thomas had missed the visitation. He wasn't in the room. Imagine being the one that struggles with doubt the most. And when the Savior comes, he comes while you're not there. I mean, it, it must just, you're already struggling with rejection. And then he doesn't even show up. He shows up for everybody else, but he doesn't show up for you. When you, when you miss the service, God moved like crazy. But the day you come, it just feels like, you know. And so Thomas is doubting, and, and Jesus again shows up a second time, and he doesn't speak to anybody but Thomas. Jesus walks into the room, and he walks right to Thomas. And he says, stick your finger in the hole. I came for you. Hallelujah. I think it's amazing about the love of God is that he'll come back just for you. He'll come and show up and move in such a way where he'll ignore everybody and speak just to you. Why? Because although he is a corporate God and he loves all of us the same, he is also an individual God who cares and is concerned about the things that you care about and are concerned about. Things that concern you concern God. Hallelujah. The things that are heavy on your heart, that weighs heavy on God's heart. And God will do all he can do to get you to bring you to a place of belief. He'll do all he can to convince you. Hallelujah. So if, after God has done all he can to prove to you who he is and you still don't believe, that's on you. But God will wear himself out trying to prove to you his love, trying to show to you who he is because he wishes that none should perish. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It goes on to say this. We're almost through. It goes on to say that they ran uh, to, to tell the disciples that Jesus was going to meet them. And it says, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them on and on. They worshiped him. Verse 11, it says, now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And it says that these priests uh, got together and devise a plan to discredit what happened. They devised a plan and invested in the lie. They came up with a lie and they said, we uh, are going to invest all our energy into this lie. And they paid large sums of money, the scripture says, to the soldiers that were keeping watch. Now, I want you to see this because the devil will shake you out of what you saw. The devil will try to do anything he can do to convince you that what you saw was a lie. And these people gave up everything that they saw. They saw it. The scripture says that for fear of him, they shook and became as dead men. I don't know if you've ever been so scared that you just fell down like you're just dead. Scripture says that they shook and for fear of them, they became as dead men. The scripture says that the priests had consulted with each other and they paid the soldiers to say that it didn't happen that way. Hallelujah. Everybody's got a price. You better be sure that your heart is rooted and grounded, that nothing moves you. We talked about it Wednesday night, had an amazing Bible study in here about what is it that has your heart. And we talked about how Jesus in, in the book of Luke came to uh, that man. He said he's what was the scripture, Luke 18 or something like that. And he came to this man comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. Everywhere you go, I'll follow you. Jesus responds with a weird response. He says, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then Jesus says to another man, right in the next verse, he says, follow me. The man says, sure, I'd love to follow you, but let me go and bury my father first. Jesus responds with what we might deem a harsh response. He says, let the dead bury the dead. But you go and preach the kingdom. Hallelujah. Then right in the next verse, another man comes along and says, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. But first, let me go say goodbye to those who are at my house. Let me say goodbye to my family first, and then I'll follow you. Jesus responds to him with what we might deem another harsh response. He says, any man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. Following Jesus is not a small sacrifice. Anybody can believe. The scripture says that Satan believes and he trembles. But to follow Jesus is another thing entirely. All of these people who wanted to follow Jesus believed him. Or else they would never have said, I'll follow you anywhere. 
They believed him, but they weren't ready to be followers. They didn't believe him enough to be a follower also. Jesus didn't come into this world just to make believers. He came for followers. He came to take people that were dead in sin and birth them into the newness of life. He came to make new creatures and to gather to himself everything that had been prepared for him by the Father. And the issue was not that, you know, you can't go to your family's funerals if you're a follower of Jesus. That's not the issue. The issue is not that you can't, you know, spend time with your family before you come to church. That's not the issue. Jesus knew the individual idols of their own hearts. I said this on Wednesday, but I'll say it again. When, when the man said to Jesus, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father first. I believe that had he responded to Jesus in faith, believing in who Jesus was. And when Jesus said, follow me, if his response was, sure, I'll follow you. Knowing that it's a sacrifice. I believe that the mercy and the love of God would have said, great, now go bury your father and I'll meet you along the way. But because his first response was not faith, his first response was, let me do this first. Jesus said, you're not ready for this because that has your heart still. I mean, you believe in me, but there's little things that still got your heart. And, and, and if you're going to be a real follower of me, you can't have anything. I mean, if you don't ever have a house to stay in. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You might never have a comfortable place to sleep if you follow me. Right. It's not guaranteed that you're going to be poor, broke, and not have nothing, but it's a possibility. And are you ready for the possibility? Hallelujah. What if I told you that God didn't die so that you can have a big mansion and a fleet of cars? It's okay to believe for those things, but if it never happens, are you still going to serve him? If he takes, if he allows you to have it and then takes it all from you in a moment, will you still trust him? Hallelujah. Are you following him? And to believe Jesus to that degree, the devil will do everything he can to keep you from believing it. Amen. Scripture says that the Jews had conspired, the heads of the Jews, the priests had conspired, and they made a lie. And the Scripture tells us that to this day, this same rumor is being issued among the Jews. Now, just a side note in terms of biblical prophecy, because we know that Scripture can be individually prophesied, and then there's the, the whole picture of what God is doing in the earth, and that is the timeline of God. And in the timeline of, time of God, Satan had planned to spread a lie among the Jews to say that the Messiah had not yet come because in the plan of God, when the nation of Israel gets saved and they're going to call for Jesus and that's when he'll come and that'll be the second coming when all of the Jews receive Jesus and the nation of Israel as a whole comes to know the Lord, comes to know the Messiah at that time, the second coming will come, happens after the rapture, that's just biblical Context, But that lie was spread that Jesus was not the Savior, that his disciples were just lying, and so they stole his body. And to this day, not just that day when, when the book was written, to this day, that rumor is still being told among the Jews. That the disciples just took his body and made up this lie that he resurrected. He never really re resurrected from the dead. He was just a prophet. Hallelujah. Let's talk about this for a minute. Jesus is God, period. Jesus is God. Hallelujah. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He was not just a good, you know, follower. He was God in the flesh. Emmanuel. God with us. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we're going to keep reading, and we're going to wrap up. Y'all good? This is blessing you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It said, then it, said, it went on down in verse 16. And it says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. Hallelujah. This is an amazing thing. That Jesus rises from the dead, and then he tells his disciples, uh, he commissions them. He gives them what could be considered the, the final teaching or the last commission, the last command of the Lord. Go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. It's not just say this prayer and get saved. Amen. Y'all with me today? Amen. Coming to the Lord and becoming a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, is more than just I said a prayer. Hallelujah. It's more than just I go to church. But he said, teach them to observe all things. Teach them. Do y'all know unbelief? Teaching destroys unbelief. If you have unbelief in your heart, you need to be taught. <laughs> because when something is taught to you, you receive information that the Holy Ghost can brew over and give you revelation to which you can then apply comprehension and then get from it manifestation. But you can't manifest that which you don't understand. You can't manifest in the earth. And this is what we've been talking about all year, that this is the time of manifestation. And whatever is in your heart is going to be manifested. So make sure you get the evil out so that God can manifest the good. Make sure you get the dark out so that God can manifest the light. We talked about it from the beginning of the year until now, that as we've entered into the time of manifestation, that whatever is in your heart, the good, the bad, the ugly, and I don't know about you, but I know I got a few people in the room that can testify that we have seen that this year. The good, the bad, and the ugly, we have seen the manifestation of things, and we might not like everything we see. I was sharing with some, some of y'all the other day that the other night I was sitting in my room, and I, a thought, you know, thoughts just run across your mind. And a thought ran across my mind of, of my father and how, because of the situation and how I was raised and all that, uh, my dad was never there. He was an alcoholic and all this terrible stuff. And all of my life, I've always said, I'll never be like my father. I don't ever want to be like him. And the thought ran across my mind because God's been dealing with me heavy about honor and learning how to honor people because the currency of heaven is honor. And we need to learn how to honor one another, whether we like each other or not, how to honor one another and esteem one another. And the scripture says, honor your mother and father on the earth that your days might be long. Amen. Amen? And, and so I thought about that, how I've said that years and years and years and years. I don't ever want to be like my father. And it wasn't so much when I made that declaration that I was just saying, I don't want to be an alcoholic, or I don't want to be this, or I don't want to be that. But I literally didn't want to be anything like my, it was more so a condemnation of him. It was more a statement out of hurt and bitterness and rejection to say, I don't ever want to be nothing like him. And I realized this week that that was, I mean, I haven't said it in years. Me and my father have had a relationship since I was 16, and we've developed, and it's grown a lot, and we've become, you know, real good uh, and, and cool, but we're still just, it's still kind of really distant, and, and you know all that. And he only lives about 20 minutes away, so it's not like I can't work on that, you know? But, but I realized that this was the thing, because I've been thinking over the last six months or so, how come I don't uh, involve him more? How come I don't think to, I mean, I think to call, but how come I don't actually do it? Or how come I don't do this? Or how come I don't do that? And the Lord, so this is the process of sanctification, brought it up in my spirit to say, this is what's hindering you because you don't honor him in your private time. So you can't honor him in your public time because what's done in the dark is going to come to the light. Hallelujah. And it's just the same way that purity in private equals power in public. What are you doing when you're by yourself? Hallelujah. Even in terms of our seek with God and our walk with God, it's not so much what we do here with each other, but when you're by yourself. Hallelujah. And prayer isn't so much I, wanna, I think about praying. you got to actually pray. Amen. <laughs> in the age of Facebook and, and social media and Twitter and all this stuff, we think something and we just put it out there as if that meant we did it. <laughs> but it doesn't. It doesn't mean you did anything. And so just to think something doesn't mean you've actually done it. How many of y'all have thought about praying and all the things you want to pray about, but you never actually prayed? Amen. Somebody honest in here? Amen. Uh, you got to pray. 
You don't just think about fasting. You got to fast. Hallelujah. We like to think about it. But we don't like to do it. Why? Because to do it is, makes us responsible. Hallelujah. I know y'all want to go home. So it goes on to say is, is to say you have to allow in the time of manifestation. When God is teaching us all things, his heart for us now in this hour is to prepare us for the soon coming of the Lord. Jesus is at the door. I can guarantee you that he is soon to come. Can't give you a day or the hour because no man knows that. But I can assure you that we are entering into the season of the coming of the Lord. Scripture says that we won't know the day nor the hour, but those that are his will know the season of his coming. And all things are lining up and everything is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer that the Lord is coming. And I don't know your personal relationship with God, but I know that if you know him, I mean, if you know him, then there's something in your spirit that agrees with that. There's something that, that bears witness with that to say, I know he is coming. Hallelujah. And so as the Lord is coming, he's sending word to his house to say, get in line, to say, get ready, get in order, receive my grace. It is sufficient because <laughs> none of this is about condemning. None of this is about making you feel bad about it. But all of this is to say, receive his grace. To overcome, receive the grace of God, to lay aside. It's not going to be easy, but it's doable. Amen. Hallelujah. I met with a lady Friday night. A lady from Virginia had heard my testimony about uh, deliverance from homosexuality. And she heard about my testimony and drove up from Virginia, uh, wanted to do a story on me. So she's doing this interview Friday night. We had like 30 minutes in between the words of wisdom in the Friday night service. And so we're in the back and she's... Uh, talking on and on and on about it and so we're, we're talking about uh, the journey of, of that and what that was like to overcome and, and what is it like now and, and how is that and, and is it just as simple as a prayer and is it just as simple as this or as simple as that and I told the lady I said no I said anything it doesn't matter if it's homosexuality or whatever it is because all sin is sin and all struggle is struggle and all issue is issue yeah. hallelujah and so I was talking with her and I said just like anything, it is a journey. And so there are good days and there are bad days. Amen. Anybody in here overcame something? There are good days and there are bad days. And I don't care what it is that you used to be every now and again. The devil will get to talking in your ear and you'll think about that thing. Hallelujah. But when you walk with the Lord, you can say as Jesus, it is written. Uh -uh. No, no, it is written. And you begin to declare over yourself as God is preparing us for his coming. You have to make sure you have the word in your heart. David said, I hide the word in my heart that I may not sin against him. Why? So that when the devil comes, which he will. Hallelujah. You might say, well, that's just myself talking. You better know the difference between your voice and his voice. Hallelujah. Our ministry is called the Voice Ministries, and that's for a reason. Years ago in West Virginia, I was preaching at a little apostolic church there, and the Lord gave me a, a word called the voice of God is or, or the, the voice of God is walking. And in that service, the Lord dealt with me about the state of Delaware. And that's why I'm here today to, to raise up a people that know the sound of his voice. But there are three voices that you need to know. You need to know God's voice. You need to know your voice, and you need to know the devil's voice. And you need to know how to tell which one is which. Well, how do I learn God's voice? Well, the more time you spend with him, the more recognizable his voice is. Now, you know your voice because you've been with it since the moment you came out your mama's womb. Okay, if we really get down to it, you know what's you. Hallelujah. And the devil's voice is anything that you can discern is not you but really don't line up with God. Hallelujah. Anything that goes against his word or against what he has shown you, and, is, and you know it's more, this is more than just me, because sometimes there's doubt that's just you. You know, that's just you doubting. But then there is doubt that is being forced on you by demons. Speaking into your ear, the accuser of the brethren. Who are you? You're not so saved as much as you think you are. You're not this and you're not that. You're never going to do this and you're never going to do that. You got to be able to do like Jesus said. When, when the devil came to him and said, bow down and worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. Hallelujah. When the devil offers you something that sounds real good. 
shoot, for real. Because sometimes that temptation comes, and you got to say, Jesus, whew. Thought about it because, you know, sometimes something come along, it make you think. <laughs> it make you really think. Let me consider. Hallelujah. And, and so I had to, took this thing into consideration, and the Lord dealt with me. And he said, you really going to compare me to that? He said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. You going to compare his wallet to mine? And so the Lord dealt with me. He said, listen, you can turn back if you want to. He said, but you'll regret it every day of your life. Hallelujah. Because to, to compare me to, to something down here, hallelujah, to give up the, I come in the volume of the book, the established identity where you just know that you know, to give that up and to walk away, you can do it. But, but it's not worth it. That's the same thing we just talked about a moment ago. When Jesus was talking to those people that said, I'll follow you, the real issue was, is there anything that you deem more valuable than me? It's the same scripture that comes along where Jesus said, be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Why? Because he said, I'd rather you burn for me or not at all. Because if you just come on and you just think that I'm just, I'm valuable, but not, you know, but you like to balance me with all this other stuff. And, and Jesus is valuable on Sundays, but the club is more valuable on Saturdays. Then, then out, that's disgusting to me. I'll spew you out of my mouth. Hallelujah. The reason I said all that is to say this, that on this journey, we must depend on the resurrection of the Lord. That it is his getting up power that sustains us to get over. And just as we follow the Lord in the death, the burial, and the resurrection, we must constantly put off the old man to put on the new. We must constantly, what Paul said, he said, I'll fellowship with him in his suffering so that I can fellowship with him in his resurrection. Amen. Hallelujah. Paul said, I, I, I fellowship with the Lord in his suffering, but also in the power of his resurrection. And so if I miss my crucifixion, then I'll miss my resurrection. And so in order for me to resurrect, I'm going to have to die. Hallelujah. I got to die to who I used to be and who I, uh, I'm struggling with now. And my own, I got to die to that. I got to die to doubt and fear and unbelief and pride and arrogance and all of this so that I can resurrect to the newness of life and joy and peace uh, uh, surpasses all understanding. Hallelujah. Anybody excited about that? Hallelujah. I have to go through my crucifixion. And what will the Lord do when you surrender to this process of dying and resurrecting it was the dying of the lord and his resurrecting when jesus died and went down into hell so this is the amazing thing i love to say that a lot of people don't really say this part jesus not only died it didn't stop at calvary hallelujah it didn't stop there but the scripture says he that ascended must have also descended jesus after he died on calvary he went down into hell, where he took upon himself all the wrath of God. We said this Friday night, we all know what it feels like to carry our own sin. We know what it feels like to carry our own issues and our own struggle. But imagine having to carry yours plus yours plus yours plus yours plus yours plus yours and yours and yours. Imagine Jesus took on the weight of not only those who were living, but those who had gone before and those who would come after. Every person that would ever exist in the human race, God took upon himself the weight of that sin. And Jesus died and went down into hell and he had to pay the price for it. And so for two, two, two days, he was tortured, right? In the depths of hell, the wrath of God poured upon the sun. And on the third day, this is the thing I love, Jesus kicked up a fuss in hell, snatched the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and led captivity captive. And the scripture said that on the third day, he rose from the dead with all power in his hand. Hallelujah. Why? Because only when you surrender and go through something can you gain the authority over it. Hallelujah. You got to go through something so that you can have authority to whoop it. 
I had to go through depression so that the Lord could bring me to a place of joy to give me authority over the demon of depression. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I had to go through sexual issues and molestation and rape and all of this so that I can come through it. God never intended for you to stay in what you're in. He intended for you to go through. Because the olive only produces the oil after the press. Hallelujah. Which means you're going to go through pressure to get out of you the best of what is in you. I was watching a commercial about some kind of new fruit, fruit drink or something that they made called, uh, um, what's the word Darwin that used? Evolution, thank you. <laughs> evolution, it's, it's this drink called Evolution, this new fruit drink. And they were saying that most fruit juices all start you know, with fruit, but then they go through this process of heating and all this stuff. And so it was this company, and they were using all kinds of graphics and stuff in the uh, commercial, which got my attention. And, and it was talking about how after it is squeezed, then it is pressed with extreme pressure to get out of it the best of the juice and to get out of it the best of the nutrients so that only the best of the best is in their drink. Hallelujah. So you're going to go through a process of being squeezed and put pressure upon to get out of you the best. Why? Because the scripture says that, that, that the, the kingdom of God is in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is in you. Hallelujah. There's a kingdom in you. What is the kingdom? Peace, love, joy, righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Where's the Holy Ghost? In you if you're born again. And, 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 and if, if the kingdom of God is in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is in you, then all of creation is groaning, uh, awaiting for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. So you got to manifest the kingdom. And in order for God to get out of you everything that he put in you, he's got to apply pressure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that God tonight just wants to get on your mind that the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that there is a resurrection for you also. I believe that God wants to get on your mind tonight. That as you celebrate the resurrection of the Lord, hallelujah, that he got up with all power in his hand. It's something to rejoice about. That means that God got up and he gave you power and he gave you authority and he gave you his presence. And when he got up, he called you away into the high place with him. Thank you, Jesus. And this is the amazing thing about it all in closing. Sorry if I said that a few times. It's part of where I come from, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but uh, it, it is this, that the scripture says that the end of all things will be the returning of all things back to Christ. And so the end of all things is the consummation of it all is that it's all going to end up back in Jesus. And so everything that God has given out one day is going to come back in two. And so in the beginning, Scripture says that on the sixth day, God took the dust of the earth and he created a body and he blew into it the ruach, the breath of God, and he created a living soul. But the Scripture says that all things are going to be returned back into Christ. So in Genesis, he exhaled. But in Revelation, he's going to inhale. And you got to know whether you're going to be in the body which receives the breath back. Hallelujah. Because if Jesus is the head of the church, he sits on a body, which is you and me. And so when God inhales, either you're going to catch the breath and remain living, or you're going to be one of those who the breath is snatched from and are cast into eternal darkness. Hallelujah. That's something to really think about. That's deep right there. Really think about that. That in Genesis, he exhaled, but in Revelation, he inhales. And who's going to catch that breath? Hallelujah. Let's stand all over the building.